In this video, I introduce the efficiency criterion for evaluating different economic policies, and I demonstrate how this efficiency criterion can be applied to a couple of the different market interventions that we've studied. In the last video, I illustrated consumer surplus and producer surplus. As a recap, here's a supply and demand diagram. In the consumer surplus, was the area above the equilibrium price up to the demand curve. The producer surplus was the area below the equilibrium price down to the supply curve. Taking these two areas together we get an object that we call total surplus. Now an alternative way to formulate this is to label the areas and to do a little box to show how these areas are divided up. For example, on this graph, now we have uh, consumer surplus is equal to the area A, and producer surplus is equal to the area B. So let's apply this, this type of reasoning to a more complicated setting, say a tax, and see how that compares to this benchmark case of a competitive equilibrium with our consumer surplus and our producer surplus. So when we introduce a tax, we introduce another player into this market, and that's the government. For the sake of the efficiency analysis, we can treat the government as a player just like consumers and producers. A dollar to the government is, from the perspective of this analysis, just as good as a dollar to consumers or a dollar to producers. So let's take a look and see what happens when we introduce a per unit tax. Remember, when we introduce a per unit tax, that acts like a vertical wedge between supply and demand. The equilibrium quantity, where this wedge just fits perfectly snugly between uh, the demand curve and the supply curve, is the quantity at which the vertical distance between the willingness to pay and the marginal cost, well, that's just going to be equal to the per unit tax. And so we have price for demanders and the price for suppliers. And this compares to the initial equilibrium price. And now we have a lot of different areas, and we can give each of those a label instead of explicitly computing the area. But before the tax, consumer surplus was still the triangle above the equilibrium price up to the demand curve. Now that triangle was A plus B plus C. Producer surplus was the area below the price down to the supply curve. That area was D plus E plus F. And the government didn't take anything and didn't give anything away. So we could add up those areas and conceptually get a benchmark for what the total surplus was before the tax. So that area is this big triangle here. It was total surplus uh, from what we had before. It was A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F. But when we introduce a tax, a couple of things happen. First, the price for demanders rises. And so what we can see is now the price, the consumer surplus is this triangle above PD up to the demand curve, out to the new quantity which is now lower. That's just A. What happened to producer surplus? Well, similarly, the price for producers decreased, and now the triangle is just triangle area F. Ah, but the government stepped in and it took some tax revenue. Maybe it took up the difference. Well, it turns out, if you look at the per unit tax, that's just the height of this wedge. And if you look at what units this tax was applied on, it's on the after-tax units. So that actually gives us the rectangle B plus D. Now let's add these up and see what we're left with for total surplus. Now we see that after the tax, we're left with areas A plus B plus D plus F. Now that is this area here on the graph. And what we'll see is that this area falls short of the total surplus calculation from before the tax. What we'll see is that now we have C plus E less total surplus. Now that C plus E total surplus that we lost, no one gets, not even the government gets it. And so what we call that is we call that area deadweight loss. There are units that go untraded for which the marginal willingness to pay is higher than the marginal cost. Each of these units in this green triangle represent a difference between the marginal willingness to pay and the marginal cost. For these units, the willingness to pay is higher than the marginal cost to produce them. Yet, 
because of the tax, uh, the tax wedge between the price for suppliers and the price for demanders, what we get is we get that those units go untraded. And that is the source of inefficiency when we think about a tax intervention policy. If we took the difference between the total surplus before and after, what we'll get is we'll get the right deadweight loss triangle. So this is a really useful method to illustrate how to, or to demonstrate uh, differences in total surplus and to isolate what precisely is the deadweight loss. So we applied the efficiency criterion to a tax intervention and we saw that there was a deadweight loss. Would we get any better luck if we subsidize the industry? Now that's the question of this part of the video. Now what I've illustrated here is how you would actually implement a subsidy. Instead of putting the tax, uh, the wedge on the left hand side as we did with the tax, put it on the right hand side uh, for the subsidy. So the supplier's price is now above the demander's price. Now I've illustrated what uh, I've illustrated the welfare gains to participating in this market before the subsidy. Consumers get A plus B, producers get C plus D, and now we intervene with a subsidy. First thing we will notice is that the price decreases for the consumers down to PD. We go from the price up to the demand curve, and that's A plus B plus C plus F. That's the consumer surplus. Similarly, we can do the producer surplus. The new price is PS. And we go from PS down to the supply curve. That gives us D, uh, that gives us B plus C plus D plus E. But none of this came without a cost. In fact, the government has some outlays here. The government had to pay out the per unit subsidy on all of the units traded. And so that means that the government had to pay out this entire box. This entire box is B plus C plus E plus F plus G. What we'll get is that there's one A, there are two Bs minus one B, still get B. There are two Cs minus one C. There's a D, and then there's an F, but that gets subtracted. There's an E, and that gets subtracted. And then there is a minus G. And so what we'll see is that surplus is now G less than it used to be. What we can do is we can go ahead and shade in the area G, and that represents our deadweight loss. Now this area represents deadweight loss because these are units that were actually traded for which the marginal cost, as represented by the supply curve, exceeds the marginal willingness to pay. These are units that from a social perspective shouldn't have been produced. But because the government subsidized the production and consumption of these goods, these goods were produced and consumed, even though, in total, from a social perspective, they didn't produce actual uh, as much benefit, um, and actually they took away from our total surplus. And so what we can see is that this efficiency criterion allows us to see fundamentally what is going on when we look at a market and a market intervention, and it allows us to assess different policies. Another thing that allows us to see is why the benchmark competitive equilibrium is a nice equilibrium to, uh, and a nice baseline for efficiency. It turns out that that's going to be most efficient under a lot of different circumstances. So there is a, uh, this is a nice example to illustrate the concepts of deadweight loss and the use of the efficiency criteria.